Uh, welcome everyone to another uh, Share Cafe Hidden Gems webinar. Uh, what's going in the market? What's going on in the market this week? Well, if you hadn't heard of US gaming stock GameStop, uh, you have now. Um, GameStop's rise has been fueled by a community on Reddit, uh, which is called Wall Street Bets. Now, this is a forum alone. This forum alone has over three million members. Uh, so it's a bit like hot copper, if you like, but it's a, a thousand times bigger and without the hated CEO. Um, now, the, Red, the Reddit community caused a massive short squeeze on GameStop, which was most heavily shorted stock in the market. And the stock rose over 600%, uh, fueled by a coordinated effort of, of thousands of retail investors. And that seemed to have flowed through to other uh, heavily shorted companies like uh, BlackBerry in the US. Now, the stupidity of the whole situation um, is that there's a stock on the ASX with the same code, GME. Uh, it rose strongly yesterday. It's up 50% today on a case of mistaken identity. And the ASX being ignorant of what's going on has now put the stock in a, a trading halt and given it a speeding ticket. Now, while this is all quite funny and, and it's indicative that there's a lot of dumb money out there, um, there's also a whole new generations, a generation of millions of investors uh, prepared to invest hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars via uh, zero brokerage platforms. Now, on a more serious note, um, we're seeing a lot more Australian companies list on overseas markets via over the uh, over the counter exchange listings and so that's becoming really valuable for Australian companies and enabling them to get exposure to offshore investors um, both retail and institutional and we saw it in Lake Resources last week with its OTC uh, share price rising 140 percent overnight driven by strong overseas interest and a 20 million dollar institutional placement. So for an Australian company, it costs about 50 grand to list on these uh, over-the-counter exchanges. And for a company like Lake, it increased its market cap by about $100 million. So while we can all laugh at the game stock story, uh, what it really highlights is, there, is that there's millions of investors looking for investment opportunities around the globe who are desperate for intelligent digital content. And that's the purpose of these webinars. It's not a recommendation. We're not offering financial advice. It's about giving an investor a better understanding of a listed company. So if you want to know more about a listed company, don't be afraid to ask questions. There's CPD for advisors, and we always welcome your feedback. So first up today, we have uh, Venture Minerals, ASX code VMX, uh, VMS, I'm sorry, market cap 65 million. It's got a one-year return of 293%. The company engages in mineral exploration business in WA for nickel, iron, cobalt, lithium, copper, silver, gold, lead, and zinc. Uh, we have with us, we welcome back the presenter, Andrew Radonajic, uh, who is the managing director. He's also a geologist and a mineral economist with 25 years experience. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks for your time. Great, excellent. Thank you very much, Tim, and it's good to be back. Uh, just uh, going through the disclaimer there, um, the company has got a very busy uh, first half of 2021 and we've uh, got two, two companies for the price of one with Venture Minerals. We're starting an iron ore mine, which we're now fully funded. We raised uh, $10 million last week, hit the accounts uh, just a couple of days ago. So um, we're full steam ahead and looking to get our first shipment out uh, early Q2. Um, we're also at the same time exploring and we had some exciting results at, at Golden Grove North just uh, here back in WA. We got up to 7% zinc in our first round of drilling. So we're going to go back and, and follow up those results um, probably in the second half of February. Um, we announced in uh, very early in, in the year uh, trench results at Coolin of, up to, of 31 metres at, up to a gram per tonne. And we've begun our maiden drill program. So we're drilling underneath those trenches at the moment as we speak. So expect some news flow in terms of results from that shortly. And, uh, and last year in, uh, in July, uh, Chalice did a joint venture with, with Venture on the Southwest project to earn 70% by spending $3.7 million. And uh, they have to spend a minimum of $300,000 before July this year. So expect some news flow towards the, uh, the end of this first half. 
just recently, we've seen an up, up surge in the tin price. So it's now just hit seven year highs. It's 23,000 US dollars per tonne. Um, so that certainly brings back our, our, our flagship project, Mount Lindsay, which the company has completed a BFS back in 2012. So in the process of relooking that from an underground perspective and doing a smaller, higher grade version, maybe CapEx around $50 million, but that certainly gives us great exposure to EV metal and the critical mineral space. Um, so um, yeah, lots to talk about and we'll try and get as much through much of that as possible in the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, next slide, please. Just a snapshot on the corporate side. I've seen that since July, there was that uptick in, in the, uh, from two to four cents for the Julemar uh, uh, look like joint venture with Chalice. Um, and then since then, we've had a steady path upwards. Uh, we now have 1.2 million shares in issue. Our market cap is a little bit more as a consequence. It's now 76 million as of yesterday. And uh, cash would be probably double that at the moment, uh, thanks to the cash injection we just received from uh, investors. So the share price has moved up nicely from, uh, like I said, around two cents to uh, around the seven cent mark just very recently. Next slide, please. The team you've got there has, has been started Venture Minerals back in 2006. So even though we, we did, all, did all the work at Mount Lindsay and Riley back up to uh, 2012, 2013, uh, we've still retained all that expertise in house. And uh, so that allows us the opportunity to, uh, to get those projects back up and running and hence the, where we are today with Riley. Next slide, please. Now we'll just move on to the uh, Riley Iron Ore Mine here in the uh, northwest of Tasmania. Next slide, please. And, and there's a map there showing in, in uh, bold red the, uh, the road access route. We're 125 kilometres from the port of Burnie is the Riley Iron Ore Mine. We're fully permitted. We've got a road agreement for the first 21 kilometres with Hydro Tasmania. And we've got an access agreement to use a port at Burnie, Wharf 6, with TAS ports. So, uh, we have uh, all the permitting required. Uh, the Mount Lindsay project is drawing to attention that is only about 15 kilometres away to the west. And there's another little iron ore project called Livingston, which is, uh, is through the permitting stage at, this, at the moment. There's another, at least a stage one opportunity of another 500, 600,000 tonnes of about 59% iron, uh, which potentially we could add to the uh, Riley mine life uh, at the end, depending on iron ore prices at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, the Riley Mine is, is very simply a, uh, a thin veneer draped over the landscape. It's pretty previously logged. The bushfire went through it uh, a couple of years ago. 1.6 million tonnes, 57% FB. It's, a, it's like the super special finds for FMG. Very, very similar product. Zero strip ratio. It's a top metre and a half. You see the whole ore body there on the screen. And top half metre is this loose gravel and the next metre this cemented gravel, uh, which we don't need any drill and blast. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the project, a couple of things we've done just recently. September last year, we tried a, a trial, trial dry screening operation. So we've got a good idea about the mining aspects and also uh, the costing of the dry screening. We found that as we originally designed this in a wet processing plant, a wet screening plant, um, we decided to move forward with that. And we've been working on constructing and doing completing all the civils. We awarded CUBE contract uh, to do the road haulage uh, so they'll be responsible from the crusher pad up to um, the uh, ship's rail, and putting onto the ship at the Port of Burnie. So a one-stop shop, the logistics chain. And, and certainly if you go back and look at our feasibility studies back in uh, August 2019, when we pressed the, the button on this project for the second time, um, we uh, had a $90 price we used in that model. We got a something like $30 million MPV, just under 30. And today, obviously, we're around that sort of 160 dollars mark. So clearly, uh, a lot more than uh, than thirty million dollars is being um, put out by the project at this stage. And more importantly, just recently, full, full funded the uh, the wet screening plant, and now the first shipment working capital is now complete, and the company can move forward to that. Next slide, please. Uh, so upcoming milestones is, is is to finish building the plant, then commissioning. First ore haulage, we're, we're hopefully looking at around about that sort of late March sort of period and first off for shipment around that sort of uh, probably early May. So we're just finalising that at the moment. There's a picture of the concrete being laid on that slide. 
So it's a pretty important time for the company, exciting phase as we go from explorer food to producer. Next slide, please. Uh, next project is the Golden Grove North project. Next slide. Um, this we acquired back in October 2018. You know, we're close past part of our 10 years, only 10 kilometres from the Golden Grove mine. We've got nearly 300 square kilometres, 25 kilometres, strike kilometres of, of a largely untested VMS sequence. Already got historical uh, shallow pipe gold intersections, exciting rock chips of up to uh, seven grams gold, 7.6% copper and, and 26 grams per tonne uh, silver. Next slide, please. Uh, since, since, since October 2018, we've been soil sampling, uh, mapping, and, uh, and I suppose ground truthing and, and getting our historical database together. We generated a whole bunch of new targets at Vulcan, Vulcan West. Vulcan North and also the Neptune Prospect, which is the closest to uh, Golden Grove. Um, so exciting, uh, we've got rock chips up to 23% copper in that program and identified a Gossman at, at Vulcan. Um, next slide, please. The next phase was for us to go and do some uh, EM and ground-based EM and we started getting up some walk-up drill targets underneath Vulcan, Vulcan West and Vulcan North. And then in September, we acquired the AUKUS uh, prospect, which uh, is on the tenure and sits, as you can see on that map there, between Vulcan West and Vulcan North. So we started getting this five kilometre long type target zone. And the great thing about AUKUS was this intersection by from iron ore exploration in 2008, where we had 22 metres of 0.8 gold, 0.6 copper, and 1.3% zinc from 38 metres. So very shallow intersection. Next slide, please. We then engaged in an RC rig and we drilled underneath that. And there are the results. We got up to one metre, 7.6% zinc. So we're getting this very rich, uh, sulphide rich metre in the hanging wall. We've got the right geology, EM responses that clearly mean sulphide. So it's been a pretty exciting um, drill campaign. And when we announced those results in December, we could see we've got, even to all be narrow, we've definitely got the grade, got the right host rock. And uh, so the company is very keen to go back and, and drill around. There's no drilling a kilometre to the north of this section and 300 metres to the south. Next slide, please. Um, and then also at the same time, we were completing, kind of, we we're trying to keep the, uh, the ground EM ahead of the drill rig. We didn't quite achieve that, but uh, the guys got another six very much stronger EM responses than when we had at AUKUS, uh, which should, should mean thicker accumulations of massive sulphide, which should also mean start getting those all grade thicker intersections. So we're, we're targeting sort of like 10 metres at 10% zinc equivalent. So we've got one metre, we need to get probably some multiples of that. So that drilling campaign is going to be starting in February, we'll be focusing on that. Next slide, please. Um, just to go on to Coolin briefly, and that, that'll, that'll be probably pretty much time out for me. But um, Coolin project, 250 kilometres east of Perth. You can see in a map there, it's in, a, it's in an interesting area. It's got Boddington, Australia's second largest gold mine. And then in the southwest, Yilga and Cratton, a little bit unloved. Anything sort of west of Southern Cross is not your typical, uh, you know, terrain like you have in Kalgoorlie and Southern Cross and Cambalda, Laverton, et cetera, in the eastern gold fields. But it's more metamorphosed, which means it's a little bit harder to recognise, but there's definitely chrome rich rocks there. You've got a mafic ultramafic sequence. But what's interesting about Coolin is that BHP also discovered a Tampia mine at Narrum Beam, which explore them taken over for Amelia's for $70 million late 2018. Um, we also got a BHV prospect which had a one and a half gram gold result but they had incoherent soil anomalies from the 1980s. We've gone back and followed up with that and you can see from our soil results you know, we've got a coherent anomaly which is you know, similar in size to Tampia. Um, so what we did next, next slide please, is we, we decided to put some trenches in to try and work out which drill direction. There's no drill hole there for within 10 kilometres and that was a rab hole. Uh, so there's the nearest gold prospect at 50 kilometres away. So we're really much virgin country. Um, but the trenching produced some exciting results. Like uh, the trenching we did late last year, we announced that on the 8th of January. We had 30 metres of, 31 metres of gram and granitic saprolite and 20 metres of 0.6 in another trench. So the drill rig started on the 7th of January. We're drilling it at the moment. So I expect some news flow of that uh, early next month. And next slide, and just uh, just touching on um, maybe even the next slide again. Um, the project Coolin is is along that metamorphic trend belt trend from Julemar. The, we did originally peg Coolin for nickel and PGE, so there's an exciting ang angle to that as well. And that'll do for me, Tim. Thank you.
Thanks, Andrew. Um, you've you've spoiled for choice there. Um, I, I suppose the question is, how do you how do you prioritise um, the asset or the commodity? I mean, prices change. Iron ore looks to have worked in your favour. How do, how do you prioritise the different commodity classes you've got? Well, look, uh, with the, the last raising, uh, if we can, you know, start, when we start generating cash from Riley, we won't have to raise again, which is an important aspect. And I think that's, you know, we can self-fund any exploration going forward. I think uh, while we're going through this, uh, you know, constructing buildings, steel, pouring concrete, all that sort of phase can be a little bit boring if you like for investors. So we, we, we'll keep them entertained with, with exploration. We're very fortunate that we kind of got our timing right in terms of, not only the states of projects that, that they need to be drilled, but they're, 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 you know, they're producing results, the, the market's responsive to these results. Um, so, you know, we'll, as always, let the drill bit probably guide us there. Um, should we get the luxury of sort of getting some, some exciting results, then it's, it'll be a good problem to have. But we don't, we're not necessarily wedded to any particular commodity. Um, you know, we, the company was focused on tin and tungsten back in back in uh, 10 years ago, and uh, we spent $35 million on that asset. So, um, but, you know, we'd rather push the advanced assets and, and, you know, grow the business from being a small iron ore miner to maybe being a significant tin tungsten miner. And if we make another Golden Grove or, or Chalice make a Julemar discovery, or, or we find a Boddington at Coolin, then, you know, I suppose I reckon it's a good problem there. And, and there's just a couple of questions around the timeline for iron ore shipments. Uh, yes, yeah, so well, at, at this stage, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, that sort of around that early May is, is the current timing. Uh, we sort of readdressing all those timing issues at the moment. Uh, with the, that last bit of money, we're sort of ordering last bits of equipment that we'd sourced previously and we're working with the suppliers at the moment to try and shortcut as much as possible. So. I reckon commissioning probably uh, the plant late March and we'll start mining around that same time. It'll probably take five to six weeks of trucking to get that first ship into the port. And and you've got a JV with obviously Chalice, who's an impressive partner. How, how active will that relationship be over the next 12 months? Yeah, Tim, look, uh, we only get to show the money shot, the two two mag signatures that Chalice put out on the, on the 21st of July last year. but. The tour anomaly down in the Southwest project and drill them up on the mag looks very, very significant. Um, at the time uh, they were adopt, trading a dollar chalice worth. And I think they did a big breakout when I got those EM anomalies down in that south, south, southern part of their anomaly. Now, the great thing about um, the Southwest project, at tour we've already done all that work. We've got 13 EM targets down the bottom of six Ks. The, uh, the, the Northern 13 kilometres, the word EM, airborne EM was a little bit disrupted by communication towers and power lines. So we've got to go back with ground EM. So we've got plenty of targets and we hit massive sulphide there in one of the holes. And we only drilled two of those from our drilling back in late 2018. So I suppose what I'm saying is that they, they've got a great starting base. They don't have to do all the work they're doing at Julemar. We're, we're kind of a little bit ahead of the curve. The difference is that we haven't hit the grade they've hit so far in their, their first campaign. So. I expect their three hundred thousand dollars they have to spend by July to um, you know to, to maybe develop maybe new EM targets to the north or maybe even fire a drill bit. So um, there's not a lot of if you like early stage work to do. And just one last quick question of the projects: what what excites you the most at the moment? Jesus, I'm asking the tough questions, Tim. Um, <laughs> look. Um, you know, Riley is, a, is an enabler, if you like. It's a means to end to get cash. Um, we'll, have, we'll have a mining team dedicated on that. Uh, I am a mine geologist, but um, you know, I'm pretty excited about Golden Grove North. Um, we, we seem to be ticking the boxes. It seems to be getting better all the time. But uh, I must admit, uh, the cooler and trench results uh, blew us out the water. So I'm still a little bit stuck on that one. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Okay, have time for it. Yeah. Really always appreciate your time and, and we'll probably catch up again in the middle of the year. Okay, thank you. All the best. Thanks thank again. you. Great. Next up, we have EMU Resources, ASX Code, EMU. Funny that. Market cap of 18 and a half million. One year return of around 12%. The company is a highly active Australian resource exploration company focused on new discoveries that have the potential to add value to investors Company exports for gold, nickel, copper, and PGE deposits. Us, uh, our presenter is 
Doug Grewer, who is the CEO. Doug, thanks for your time. Over to you. Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today in the Share Cafe. Uh, yeah, I'm the CEO of EMU. I've uh, been here for the last 18 months with EMU. We don't do a lot of presentations. We do a lot of work, a uh, very, very busy explorer. The last four years, we've been up uh, in the Maracunga region in Chile, in the Andes, uh, exploring there. But uh, given the lack of uh, progress that we made there and uh, in order to, to save uh, the, the resources we had and the looming global pandemic, uh, coupled with some, uh, I guess, the issues that Chile are having uh, for sovereign risk, the board made a decision to uh, generate or, or put more effort into project generation. We had a global focus initially, but ultimately that came back to us uh, selecting uh, projects within driving distance of our office in West Perth. Uh, so that's proved to be a very, very good strategy and it's landed us with some excellent projects uh, along the way. Um, so these are discrete projects all based within the Greenstone Belts, uh, WA Wheat Belt um, and uh, undercover uh, gold, nickel and copper essentially. Our share capital, uh, we've been around since 2007, and I guess uh, in comparison to, to some of our peers, um, we're, we, we haven't, uh, we have we're 360 million shares, we're, we're doing okay. Um, we've got an extraordinary loyal register owned by true believers who believe what we do and like how we operate. But we'd like to see a little bit more volume in, in our stock. Um, and, and as I mentioned, this is our first presentation for about 18 months. Um, currently, Cash at Bank uh, reported October 20, 1.3 million. Uh, as far as our stock goes, trading at five cents these days or today, and um, in, in terms of director's holdings with fully paid and contribs, uh, around about 9% of the stock. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our board. Um, I know a lot of juniors talk about the experience in our board, but uh, we can demonstrate that with uh, very good DNA, particularly with our chairman, Peter Thomas, who was the founding chairman of Sandfire Resources and Terry Streeter, uh, uh, founding chairman of Western Areas, and uh, of course, uh, his involvement with nickel and Jubilee mines. So strong copper, nickel and gold. Gavin Rutherford is a, is a contractor, um, adding uh, great diversity on the board. And Tim um, is, is our focus uh, on, on the finance side. Um, with equity and capital markets and um, as a chief investment strategist for sovereignman.com. Next slide, please. Uh, exploration projects that we've selected in WA and then we uh, looked uh, ex extensively for, for good projects. And uh, we've, as I say, mentioned that we're in driving distance from Perth. Um, these projects uh, represented uh, gold, nickel, copper um, and all of them have had some form of exploration history or mining activity on them. Uh, they're essentially drill ready. We're actually drilling now uh, at Nose Nest at Yalgoo, uh, which is very close to uh, the project that Andrew was talking about um, in, in the Yalgoo area. Uh, we're drilling 9,000 metres of RC as we speak. All of the projects um, are logistically um, beneficial. We've got uh, road transport, um, serviced by towns. Um, so we've, we've selected these uh, so that these, these can be operated very quickly. Uh, adds a completely different dimension from working in remote Chile. Uh, next slide, please. Now's Nest Gold Project at Yalgoo is a historic uh, high-grade gold mine, uh, mined between uh, 1923 and 1941. The mine stopped at uh, level five, 145 metres below surface. Uh, 22 grams of uh, uh, gold grade for about 28,000 ounces. Uh, it stopped because primarily because uh, the water uh, couldn't be controlled and uh, labour shortages during World War II. Uh, it's, we've identified or our, from the, our vendors identified a shallow mineral resource open to depth and a long strike, which we're testing now and we're currently doing a resource, um, resource drill out. Um, this area has extensive upside potential. It's located in the same uh, greenstone belt as Golden Grove. And uh, the recent excess, success by Firefly to our north and Venture Minerals to our east um, demonstrates the, the uh, prospectivity. 
Uh, we're currently also running uh, an IP uh, geophysics program um, um, for gradient array, which will give us some better vectors on, the, on our structure. Next slide, please. Uh, alongside or adjoining Now's Nest, uh, we then managed to uh, round up uh, some prospectors leases that have been held uh, for the last 60 years or so uh, under private ownership, as has the Now's Nest gold mine. Um, so we've been able to package uh, the Now's Nest prospect in with, with, sorry, the Monte Cristo prospect in with Now's Nest, providing us an additional three kilometres of strike, um, which has a, a series of historic gold workings along. We've been, uh, one of the um, priorities with this, this program is to also drill out the old Monte Cristo gold prospect, which we've started to do. Next prospect, please. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So this uh, magnetic uh, picture on the left shows where we're located uh, and how our tenements come together and how we've amalgamated the package. A very interesting geology uh, and a greenstone, digestive greenstone sitting between two uh, granite intrusions. Uh, VMS on the east side, but uh, gold um, through a pathfinder in, in the historic mine at Now's Nest there. So. Um, we're, we're anticipating that we will continue to, to open up um, new ground through here, and we've got some very exciting uh, prospect here. So next slide, please. Sunfire is a, a package of tenements that sits, uh, adjoins the Venture Minerals Southwest project in which Chalice have taken up uh, recently uh, in looking for another Julemar lookalike. We haven't even started here. Um, all of these projects we've only picked up in the last few months, and we, I think we announced uh, on the 28th of September. So we've got lots of work, but this is a pretty exciting potential nickel sulfide. It's had some soil sampling and it's shown some uh, nickel, a, a, a large nickel and a large copper anomaly. Um, there's been diamond drilling and percussion drilling done there. There's been IP surveys. We're pulling it all together at the moment, um, uh, but it looks to be that we can do much work in extending the strike uh, that has already been identified. Um, we've got a highly anonymous copper, 100 times background, which is of great interest to us. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the results from the drilling in particular of interest to us has been uh, the, the high nickel, uh, where we're actually looking at nickel sulfide. Um, so we're getting up to 1.8% from 16 metres on the drill. And if you see that picture there, you'll see that the north and south extent of this, uh, these anomalies have been truncated at fence lines. So one of the things that has been obviously difficult in the past has been access. In our due diligence process, we're able to, to engage with landowners and uh, that led us to, to take up the project on the basis that we had access to extend that, that section. But as I mentioned, the, the Southwest project that Venture have and, and now Chalice are, are looking after uh, join us to the north and to the west. So it's a pretty exciting project for us. Next slide, please. The Viper project is a historic uh, copper mine, which is located uh, just uh, north of Jerramunga in Western Australia. It's produced something like between six and 300 tonne of copper, high grade copper. Um, we're not sure, it's very difficult to ascertain the historical records here. But it is a mine. Uh, it, it, it apparently has five drives with a total depth of 13.5 metres, although there, um, there is some, some talk of it being much de deeper but having collapsed. Um, it's a discrete historical occurrence and copper nickel um, PGEs and possible gold. Uh, it's associated with shearing and, and some mafric intrusions. The interesting thing about this project is that no work has been done there other than the mine, so that is the pathfinder. Um, there's been no drilling and there's been um, uh, no, no geochem in that particular area. Uh, regionally, there has been a little bit of work. Next slide, please. Graceland is a, what we call a bullseye target. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a quick one for us because it's, um, it's a red or green uh, go or, or stop. Um, it's 40 k south of Hyden in, in WA. Um, it's a five kilometre long magnetic feature, so, which is seven kilometres away from the quicksilver discovery that uh, Goldmine Resources have got. Uh, that is a laterite discovery. Gracelands is conspicuously absent, absent of any laterite development. So we are targeting here 
uh, sulfide nickel, and we've got very, very strong uh, magnetic signature, um, 70 to 120 meters. Um, we, we, are, we have also been able to get access to this land uh, with, the, with the landowners, the farmers. So um, we're able to get into there and test this very soon. Next slide, please. Eight Mile Dam is a, is a project up in Menzies. This is a hot area. Um, we originally took this up to look for gold and we've discovered that uh, we'll now be looking for nickel. Uh, we've got a uh, slither of uh, ultramafic uh, um, greenstone here and uh, we'll be starting a uh, auger drilling program shortly for this undercover. Next slide, please. So we're a very active explorer, as I mentioned. We have substantial news flow this year, five discrete and separate exploration projects, each with distinct targets. Um, assay results will be coming through as of now, and in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be progressively putting those to market through to April. That will be coming from our 9,000 metre RC program at Now's Nest, which is the picture you see there. Um, we're looking at high grade uh, gold and I'm targeting a resource upgrade, uh, testing uh, depth and strike extensions at Now's Nest. We have the potential to be mining this in the next 12 months or so. Uh, we have a number of approvals already in place and uh, we've been blessed by the fact that we've got toll treatment uh, available uh, from a number of mills in the area. Drilling is also uh, happening at the Monte Cristo project, so prospects, so there'll be some uh, news flow coming from there. So I guess we've got the right minerals at the right time, diversified through gold, copper, nickel and PGEs. We've got budgets to do work on ground at all these projects over the next 12 months. We're based uh, within driving distance of Perth and we have no land access issues. So um, we're worth uh, following for the moment. We have uh, a, a quite a strong news flow, as I mentioned, coming through this year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I uh, haven't heard of EMU and there's not a lot of uh, chatter about it. So it's, it's nice to be introduced to the company. Um, you've got a quality board there and you look like you've got some great assets. Do the assets come to you or do you go looking for them, particularly being so close to home? Tim, we, uh, we, we've been a global company. We've explored um, across the world uh, since 2007 and uh, our focus to WA um, resulted from, I guess, we looked at over 70 projects globally and we we're already looking at projects before the pandemic broke. But our strategy defined itself to WA fairly quickly because we needed to access we have a team in-house. We don't ex we don't outsource our geology or any of our exploration. So we needed to make sure we could work. So yeah, no, we actually targeted it here. And um, and and drill rigs. We always hear there's kind of a shortage of equipment. Is is that the case at the moment? Yeah, look, it is. But uh, we're very fortunate that one of the vendors of one of the projects is uh, is, uh, is on the register, and uh, we've found uh, that uh, that has been incredibly fortuitous for us. And uh, we also hear that um, assays and laboratories have been uh, difficult to turn around uh, sampling. Uh, I can't speak highly enough of the, the laboratory we're using and uh, we're able to turn around our results fairly quickly. That's why I'm confident that I can say that we'll be having assay results through February, March and April. And, and a question in terms of results, a question here on your, on your quarterly reports that they're due shortly? Uh, yes, the quarterly report the will be out, uh, if not today, over the weekend. Okay, great. Okay, that's, uh, that's all we have time for, Doug. We really appreciate uh, your story and we look forward to following that again and get you back on the middle of the year or something. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for sharing that. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Noxo Farm, ASX code NOX, market cap around $172 million. Uh, the stock has had a one-year return of up 175%. The company is a clinical stage drug development company that focuses on research and development of drugs to enhance the effectiveness and safety of both chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, we have with us the presenter, Graham Kennedy, who is both the founder and the CEO. Uh, Doug, we might just get you to um, turn off your camera if you don't mind, and uh, we'll now pass over to Graham. Oh, good day, Tim. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Graham Kelly. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of the company, and uh, 
I guess my aim today is to explain why we believe that the company is about to make a very significant uh, mark in, in the world. Next slide, thanks. Uh, okay. Sorry, Graham, over to you, mate. Okay. Uh, so, look, I thought this being my first time uh, uh, addressing this group, I thought it might be uh, useful just to briefly mention my track record in the in the industry. Uh, my background is as a scientist, and I've got uh, 50 years in the drug development business, and that all started with a PhD at the University of Sydney Medical School. Um, that led to the university uh, manufacturing and selling a, a drug for kidney transplant patients. So that was the start. And since then, I've founded and uh, run four drug development companies, starting in 1994 with Novagen, which uh, at, at the time was, I recall, just the third or fourth biotech company to list on the, uh, on the ASX. And ironically, uh, we listed exactly the same day as CSL. Uh, now, nine years later, uh, with Novagen, a $15 million billion floated turned into a company worth over $800 million. So all of these four companies uh, originally IPO'd at, uh, at values of between 15 and 20 million, and all of them went on or uh, hopefully are going on to, to some notable success. Next slide, thanks. So the, uh, th these are the key metrics, and I'll, I'll just mention two of them. Uh, the first one being a cash position, and the next one being the, the news flow situation. We, uh, we've started this year with, uh, with $23 million in cash. Um, we're expecting a, an R&D rebate uh, of at least $4 million in the next couple of weeks. And in four weeks' time, uh, we, uh, we have 6 million options that are due to be uh, exercised, and, um, uh, and they're going to be underwritten, so uh, we can be guaranteed of $6 million coming in. So that gives us a potential uh, cash position of, of about $33 million, which uh, uh, puts us in a very strong position to uh, finish off our, or execute our clinical program for the year, and in fact, take us into 2022. In terms of news flow, uh, um, we're looking at quite a considerable news flow for the next six 12 to 12 months. Uh, with four clinical trials, uh, all of them have inbuilt uh, regular reporting points, uh, plus a, a pretty extensive uh, preclinical program, uh, these can all be counted on to generate uh, plenty of news. Next slide, thanks. Now, uh, it's, I've got to be careful I don't uh, turn this talk into a science lesson, but uh, this, is, this is the only techie uh, slide you're going to be asked to look at, and you need to have some idea of, uh, of the drug we're talking about today. Now, the drug is Vionda, and it's the company's main asset, and it's what's known as a, an immunotherapy drug, and that simply means that it stimulates the immune system to fight cancer. Now, cancer cells should not be able to survive in the body. If the immune system is doing its job, it will kill them. And the cancer cells are able to survive uh, because they trick the immune system uh, and, they, and they, they do that tricking uh, using a basket of tricks. Uh, that includes disguising themselves, uh, uh, in essence, hiding behind a cloak so the immune cells can't see them. It includes putting on a suit of armor that uh, the immune cells can see them but can't, can't get to them. Uh, and it also includes forcing the immune cells out of the tumor. And, uh, and this is the key point uh, in that uh, cancers use multiple tricks. They don't just rely on one single trick. Uh, they've got a basket of goodies up their sleeve. And this is why immunotherapy, as incredibly promising as it is, doesn't work for most patients. Uh, and this is despite immunotherapy being universally regarded as the future of cancer therapy. And the reason it's not working is because the great majority of immunotherapy drugs are only looking to overcome single tricks. They don't, they don't go for the, for the full basket of tricks. And that means that if immunotherapy is going to be effective, we're either going to have to mix and match uh, different immunotherapy drugs, each, each one having its own uh, particular um, action uh, in order to cover off the full range of tricks, or 
we're going to have to develop drugs that uh, that have multiple tricks, uh, have multiple uh, tricks up their own sleeve. And this is where Vionda comes in. Uh, it, it's a unique drug because it actually uh, fixes up a number of the different tricks that cancer cells are, are using. So Vionda is not a one trick pony, it, it's a multiple trick pony. And one of the, the key uh, modes of action uh, is, the, is the, what you see in the middle of the, of the screen, which is something called converting tumors from cold to hot. The cold tumor is one where the, the, the cancer cells have forced out all the immune cells. A hot, a hot tumor is one where they've been allowed to come back in. The vast majority of human tumors are cold. And that means that if, you're, if your immunotherapy drug is working uh, around the edges of this or working on immune cells that are outside the, 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 the tumor, unless you can get those immune cells back into the tumor, you're not gonna see much action. And that's the problem with the current immunotherapy uh, 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 treatments. They are not able to achieve this uh, conversion of, of cold to hot. And that is uh, categorical what uh, Vionda does. Now, the, the immunotherapy market currently is worth about 30 Australian, uh, Australian dollars, 30 billion. 30 billion Australian dollars. And that's coming uh, from uh, a number of, of, of immunotherapy treatments, just, just a handful of treatments that collectively are working in less than about one in 10 cancer patients. It's more like about 5% of cancer patients. So if we could get immunotherapy to work in more patients, uh, that represents the biggest uh, prize in oncology. Uh, and uh, with many analysts throwing around uh, values of, of over $150 billion uh, in terms of uh, annualized sales. Now that large prize naturally has brought a lot of players into the race uh, and uh, uh, Noxifarm is one of, one of them. Uh, but we're confident that uh, based on how we know Beyond is working, that uh, it's a standout prospect uh, because it isn't one of these one trick ponies. Thanks a lot, thanks. Uh, Noxifarm is testing uh, Beyond uh, uh, as an immunotherapy drug in, in four programs. All of these are underway and they all involve several hundred patients. Uh, three of the programs uh, in cancer patients and one of them is in, in COVID-19 patients. Now you're going to be hearing a lot about these uh, uh, programs over the course of the year. They're all exciting programs. The, uh, just very briefly, the Ionic program uh, is, is particularly exciting because it's uh, using Beyonder with uh, another drug called Obdivo, which is, uh, which is owned by the big US uh, pharma company, Bristol Myers Squibb. Now, last year, Obdivo sales uh, were uh, US dollars, $8 billion. And that accounted for about 30% of the company's revenue. And yet Obdivo struggles to work in most cancer patients. Most cancers are resistant to Obdivo. So, the rewards for us being able to help Obdivo a, a, a work in a lot more patients are going to be pretty obvious. Now, I could talk about any one of these uh, programs today, but uh, next slide, thanks. I'm just going to talk about uh, the Lupin study uh, uh, today. Next slide. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the drug is, is called... Um, uh, lutetium PSMA 617, which is too much of a mouthful. So I'm going to just refer to that as the, as the new Novartis drug because uh, uh, Novartis acquired this drug in 2018 in a $9 billion uh, deal when they bought two companies. And um, the figure you see on the left is a man with advanced uh, uh, prostate cancer. Every dot you see there is a single secondary tumor. And, uh, and all those dots is the reason why uh, prostate cancer is invariably fatal once it becomes metastatic. And uh, most of those tumors are in the, are in the skeleton and uh, skeletal tumors, bony tumors are incredibly painful. They can't spread, uh, so they, uh, they cause a lot of pressure and that causes pain. Now, uh, Novartis is, uh, is the sixth largest uh, pharma company in the world. Uh, they have a, a market uh, value of uh, in excess of uh, 200 billion US dollars. 
So they see this as being a, a major play. And uh, the, the, the company made an announcement a couple of years ago before they bought, they bought into this technology that they see this sort of technology as their, as their future. And uh, the drug is injected uh, intravenously. Uh, it carries an, a, a radioactive isotope. It seeks out all the tumours. So it's a way of delivering radiation to all those dozens, if not hundreds of tumours around the world, uh, around, the, around the body uh, uh, in a far more effective way than you're ever going to be able to deliver radiation by standard radiotherapy. Uh, ne next slide, thanks. Now, the reason why drugs like this are urgently needed, and, and this is an exciting drug, the reason they're needed is, is because of this, the, the, the sheer statistics of prostate cancer. It's a major problem. And as you can see on the, the graph on the right, uh, it, uh, the, the incidence is exponential. The older you get, the more likely you are to get, uh, to get prostate cancer. And as the, the world uh, is, uh, is you know, undergoing, we're seeing increasing longevity, uh, we're all living longer. This means that uh, cancers like prostate cancer are going to become a major problem. So already, uh, we, uh, the world has an estimated uh, 360,000 deaths from prostate cancer, and that uh, that looks set to rise. Next, next slide, thanks. Now, this this new drug is not a panacea. Uh, it's not going to cure people. Uh, in, in fact, it, it's expected to help roughly 40 to 50 percent of men live longer, which is something because it's certainly better than the alternative. And uh, uh, the question that uh, St. Vincent's, well, St. Vincent's Hospital here in Sydney have played a leading role in the development of this technology. Uh, they've been part of this Novartis drug from its very beginning. And they approached us about three years ago and, uh, uh, with the, and they asked the question, did we think that Vionda would help the Novartis drug work in more men and in those where it was working, work uh, provide a much deeper uh, effect, so you end up with lo longer, longer uh, survival. And uh, so we agreed to do this, and it's a, a phase two study has been set up and um, it involves 56 men. They've all got late stage cancer. They've all got, they're all typically like that man you see on the left. Uh, they have no remaining treatment options. They have an anticipated survival of between about two and six months, and on average, that would be about four and a half months. So these are men who are already in palliative care with no remaining treatments. So they were given a combination treatment uh, over six cycles. Uh, next slide, thanks. And uh, this, is the, this is the data that we've, uh, we've presented to date. Uh, now, a bit of background first. The, the, the first thing is we're measuring something called the median overall survival. And this is the standard measure that bodies like the FDA uh, need to see before they approve a new drug. It simply is measuring that time when half the men are still alive and half of them are deceased. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a pretty relevant thing, apart from uh, for the regulators, it's a pretty relevant thing for a patient too. Because if you, if you are a patient deciding whether you, you, you or not you want to put yourself through another particular treatment, and uh, how important you see what uh, little life you have left, it becomes pretty relevant as to how long you're likely to get out of, out of a new treatment. The second bit of background is that once a man reaches the stage of metastatic disease, as we saw in that picture on the last uh, slide, um, uh, th there are three standard uh, treatments, three chemotherapy treatments available. They're referred to as first line, second line, and third line. And, uh, and you follow, you, you go into each new line after, after the previous uh, treatment has, has failed, which it does eventually in all men. And eventually you end up in, uh, in what's uh, end stage cancer. Now, the, uh, the evidence suggests that uh, Novartis are looking to introduce this new, uh, new drug uh, after second line therapy. In other words, they're going to, they want to become the new third line so the current third line will be pushed to uh, nudge the side and become fourth line. Now, after, after second line uh, therapy, uh, we know that the, we know historically that uh, the survival time, the, the median overall survival time is eight and a half months. And, uh, and so the, the question is, well, what effect will the new Novartis drug have on that? 
And uh, we know from a, a study carried out in Australian Hospital, and it's the only one that's been published, that where the Novartis drug was used on its own in these men, the, the median overall survival went up to 13 and a half months. In other words, they achieved, the drug delivered about a five month uh, increase in survival. Now, for the Lupin study, uh, the, the hospital said, we want to, we want to put uh, Beyonder to the acid test. We're not going to use men after second line. We're going to use them after third line. So these are men who have reached the end of their treatment course. There was nothing left. They were all going to die in roughly four and a half months. And, uh, and what has, was reported 12 months ago is that in these men, the combination treatment delivered a median overall survival of 17.1 months. That, that is over 12 months uh, um, extended survival. And you've got to compare that to the extra five months that appears to be uh, being delivered by the Novartis drug uh, uh, when you're using much, much earlier stage people. Next stage, next slide, thanks. So the, in two weeks time, the, the hospital is going to be reporting uh, uh, on the next updated data. So this will be on the full 56 men. So the previous report 12 months ago was only on 32 men who'd been receiving lower doses of Beyonder. The next uh, report in two weeks time is on, uh, is on the full 56 men uh, and includes all three dosage points. Now, the, the oncologists at, at, uh, who are running this study uh, have already acknowledged that 17.1 months overall survival, or median overall survival for these, for these men at late stage disease is a remarkable outcome. The question is, what is going to be reported in two weeks time when we look at the, uh, uh, the full 56 men? Um, whilst 17.1 months is important and remarkable, anything north of that would be truly significant and, uh, and would represent, in our view, a potential major breakthrough in the, in the treatment of prostate cancer. Next slide, thanks. So if that's achieved, what would such an outcome be worth? Well, uh, what you're looking at here are the three most recent transactions uh, in the prostate cancer uh, uh, space. Pfizer uh, paid 14 billion US dollars uh, four years ago uh, for a company which is now, this is now the, the second, the current second line therapy that we were talking about. And Novartis uh, had to pay 6 billion US dollars to buy two drugs, uh, two companies, to get their hands on this uh, lutetium PSMA drug. So they've invested 6 billion US dollars. So the, the question is, what is Noxifarm worth if, if the combination of Beyonda and the Novartis drug ultimately represents the, uh, the, the new third line treatment? Uh, next slide, thanks. And uh, so it's with that question that I'm going to uh, finish and uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, Graham, we, we're actually out of time, but I, I have one quick question and then we'd like to follow up on Share Cafe. We've got some technical questions, which I think might help. Um, from a corporate perspective, the company owns a stake in Narada. How does that play into uh, Noxo Farm? Well, it's about a 30% stake. It was an opportunity uh, to do some drug development that we would, would never have happened if it stayed within uh, uh, Noxo Farm. So we, we, we spun it out to, to do exactly what it's doing now. It's, it's a great company and uh, a 30% uh, stake uh, should deliver a pretty good value in due course. Okay, great, Graham. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. We'll follow up with some questions on Chair Cafe and, and get those questions answered. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Uh, finally, uh, we have Rocks Resources, uh, market cap of around $70 million. It's had a one year return of around 22%. Uh, the company is a mineral exploration company with advanced gold and nickel projects, uh, a common theme today. We have with us again, uh, the Managing Director, Alex Passmore. Alex, over to you. Thanks for your time, mate. Great, thanks, Tim. And, um, and welcome all to the uh, Share Cafe Investor Presentation Series. So uh, yeah, flicking over to the disclaimers. Uh, so just to, uh, the highlights for ROCs, um, if, you, if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with, with ROCs, 
we um we have multi commodity multi commodity exposure. We own the uh, the 1.2 million ounce UME Gold project in Western Australia. Uh, that that's an advanced project, and and uh, we'll be uh, looking to bring that into production in the next couple of years. And we own the Fisheries Nickel project, which has a 78,000 ton uh, contained nickel resource with a scoping study complete, uh, and uh, and certainly very economic at today's nickel prices. Uh, and, and the company um, is looking to progress that as well. Uh, ROX is, um, is valued mostly on the basis of being a gold company uh, rather than a nickel company. And on, uh, on the current enterprise value, ROX is trading around half uh, of the average to its peers in the gold development space. And when you account for our nickel project, we're, we're trading at about a third of, of our peers. So um, one might suggest that's a pretty uh, attractive um, valuation and an entry price into, a, into an active gold explorer uh, that's looking to develop its gold project. Uh, so on exploration and on activity, the rocks has had a very busy 12 months. Um, we've discovered uh, new zones of mineralization at you and me. Uh, and then followed that up with uh, with new geophysical techniques. Now, while this is important, uh, it's because you and me is an old gold field. It was uh, it was a gold mine that um, was mined originally in in, in 1910 and 1920, uh, and then again commercially in the 80s and 90s. And so, a, a lot of these geophysical techniques um, haven't been applied to to the you and me belt before. Uh, in terms of Rox's position at UME and also in the Nickel Project, we have very large land holdings over both. Uh, and it's been our philosophy that if you're going to be active in a belt, you might as well try and own most of it um, to give yourself that, that valuation leverage um, should your exploration be successful. Uh, the Rox board and management um, have, have had demonstrable success uh, in the mid cap sector. Um, and uh, we, we've got a good team that, that are very active. Next slide, please. So um, just corporately on rocks, so ticker RXL, uh, a market cap uh, today of about $70 million, 9 million in cash and receivables. Uh, we uh, just um, talking to our share price graph for a second. Um, the big spike you can see there in, in June, July uh, of 2020 related to some uh, spectacular uh, drill results at a project at a prospect at you and me called Grace. Uh, and uh, we've then spent the last um, the last six to nine months following that up, uh, and and uh, whilst we have been very busy and and uh, uh, internally we're very happy with how things are going, um, that ore body is potty and it is difficult. It's very high grade when um, in places, but it, but it is potty. Uh, and so uh, about three weeks ago, we put out a, a, a fairly detailed exploration update and obviously the market didn't take too kindly to that and the share price has slipped from five cents to about three and a half cents now, uh, which is somewhat frustrating because we're, we're all very, um, uh, you know, that, that's the nature of exploration um, and we are, and we are um, happy with uh, where things are at, you know, from an internal standpoint. So um, we, we think we've been unfairly marked down there. Um, and see that as an overreaction. Next slide, please. So just quickly on the team. So the board uh, is Stephen Dennis, myself and John Mayer. Uh, Stephen is a, a, a lawyer by background, um, but also you know had a long career developing um, developing complex projects in the, in the mineral space. Uh, John, Dr. John Mayer is a geologist uh, and the MD of Greenland Minerals and Energy. So he, he's got a very strong geological background. Uh, and for myself, I'm a, I'm a geologist with a finance degree. I spent many years in the, in the capital markets and before that was a geologist for Western Mining. Uh, Brett Dixon is our, um, is our uh, CFO and company secretary. Uh, and then we're, we're ably assisted by, um, by the technical team of, of geologists you can see there. Next slide, please. So you and me is Rox's flagship project. Uh, it, it sits in the center of the Yulgarn Craton in Western Australia. Uh, in a greenstone belt um, called the UME Greenstone Belt. It's, 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 um, uh, uh, it is a uh, 150 kilometer long, um, very well endowed, gold, well endowed, um, well mineralized belt um, that is to the north of Payne's Find and, and south of Sandstone. So Rocks holds um, a, a, its tenure in the UME belt uh, in a series of uh, joint ventures which have varying economic interests, but but overall, we, we own a range of tenements uh, with an interest of between 45% and 100%. Um, 
uh, and importantly in the mine area we're, we're in a joint venture on, on a 70 30 basis the, the mine area that you can see on that figure on slide eight uh, is around 10 kilometers by um, by about eight kilometers so um, just to give you an idea um, you know how, how much tenure we've got in that belt so over 600 um, square kilometers so uh, the project comes with a resource 1.2 million ounce resource um, which is a good um, start but only very you know very much the start for us um, we, we see that growing substantially over the, over the coming year uh, the mine previously produced 670,000 ounces at 5.4 grams uh, and closed in 1997 when the gold price was uh, was $400 an ounce. And so the gold price at the moment in Aussie dollar terms is about 2,400. So um, plenty of scope to, um, to, to simply just bring the mine back into production um, given the higher gold price. But, you know, first of all, we're looking to, um, we're looking to in increase the resource before we do that. Next slide, please. Uh, when we do bring the mine back into production, it's um, it, it has um, a, a good amount of infrastructure to start with. So it, it is a disturbed site having previously been mined. Um, and so we have roads, uh, core sheds, workshops, airstrip, ball fields, tailings, dams, uh, mine offices, uh, you know, all, all which, um, which save on CapEx, but also make exploration um, a lot easier. Uh, so, so that's a good head start for us. The other important thing about um, any redevelopment scenario for you and me is that we it's a disturbed site and it sits on a mining lane. So, so that um, lets your government approval process timeline shorten. Uh, and of course, we've got plenty of historical data. So we know how the ore bodies perform in terms of metallurgy, um, you know, if there's any dewatering issues or if there's any uh, geotechnical issues. Next slide, please. So just zooming into the mine area, um, the, um, the, the two main rock types uh, sim simplistically are a greenstone belt and a granite uh, or, um, or a series of basalts and dolerites and, and granitic rocks. Most of the gold at UMA occurs along the boundary of the granite and the greenstone. Uh, and there are two very important structures controlling gold mineralization. So there's a series of north to north uh, east trending structures, and you can see on slide 10 where um, where I've highlighted the UNME shear zone, and then off to heading off to the northwest, the main load shear zone, uh, and you can see where um, where the old pits are outlined in, in in blue there. Now the main pit, the southernmost pit, is about is almost a kilometre long, uh, just to to give you a sense of scale. So our, our um. Our uh, focus is on adding to the 1.2 million ounce resource, uh, and, and uh, we we see several places where that those um, where significant additions can occur. Um, we've had um, we've had some a lot of success at a deposit called Grace, which is a a north a striking uh, structure that is in the granite uh, that that um, peels away from the main load shear zone. Next slide, please. So just zooming into uh, the main pit in a little bit more detail. So you can see there um, where the growth of ore body sits, um, uh, un basically underneath the uh, old gold processing plant uh, and adjacent to the old pit. Uh, and you can see that some of the spectacular grades that we, we see at Grace. So, you know, 11 metres at 18, 14 at 31, 5 metres at 125, 9 metres at 13. These are all spectacular gold grades. Uh, and, and more importantly, that structure uh, trends north-south and the, all the previous mineralisation um, at UME trends northwest west southeast um, And uh, the, the, the uh, junction of those areas, of, of those two structures, um, which are really a conjugate set of uh, geological structures, are, are where you get blowouts in, in, in significant um, gold grades and, and widths. Uh, and so our key next target is, is an area called the junction target area, which you can see is to the south of the pit where, uh, where, where the grace um, structure uh, runs and intersects um, another, another, another belt of rocks and structure coming in from the northwest trending down to the southeast. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a slide showing, a simplified slide showing the, the structural uh, architecture of the belt. And you can, see, um, you can see where the junction target sits there. Next slide, please. So now we're looking in long sections. So we're looking east in a, in a cut through sense, um, looking um, at 
the pit side on. Uh, and and uh, we can see where the historical mining has gone down to. So um, we have a series of smaller pits to the north or to the left, and then the you and me main pit that we were just looking at uh, on the right hand side or to the south. There's, there's an underground mine uh, developed uh, underneath the pit uh, that um, uh, that was mined out in the 90s uh, and um, was shut down um, due to low gold price, plus dewatering issues, plus a whole range of other issues. But um, in what you can see there in, in that old mining area where, where, where there is you and me deeps noted on slide 13, um, there's a 700,000 ounce resource sitting there. So if you look at the junction target and where grace intersects, um, you know, we're looking at a, a, a size that's equally, uh, that's equal or if not bigger. And to give you an indication of, of what sort of grades we think are there, you can see that the top part of the uh, junction target was mined um, in a shaft called the Pollard shaft in the 1930s, uh, where there was um, a head grade of 15 grams per tonne. So they're, they're, the sort of, um, they're the sort of grades that we're expecting. Next slide, please. So in summary for you and me, um, we, we've discovered grace this year uh, and, um, and uh, as we're following that up, um, we, we've then, discovered, we've then um, reviewed the geological model for you and me more broadly uh, and, and that's um, brought targets like, um, targets like junction um, to life um, and highlighted how, you know, how, many, um, how many additional ounces they can bring um, into the overall resource inventory. So we see, um, we see the UME Gold project being a small high grade starter project followed by a, a, a larger um, project um, that can take into account the open pits and so forth and, and that can add life. Uh, next slide, please. So ROX's second project, the Mount Fisher Nickel project is also located in Western Australia. It's in, uh, it's in a greenstone belt called the Mount Fisher Greenstone Belt, which is to the east of Leinster. Uh, rocks discovered nickel in the fisheries, in the Mount Fisher belt in 2012. Uh, and you can see there, there's some pretty spectacular intersections, um, you know, fr from the fisheries um, nickel deposits. So um, th these are sulphide deposits, uh, high quality, um, uh, low impurity, uh, and make a, a good nickel concentrate. Um, that, that would be of interest to um, plenty of players in the sector. So um, there are resources of 78,000 tonnes of contained nickel at the project over three deposits um, across a strike length of about three kilometres. And we're just about to see how they sit next to each other. So next slide, please. So here we are looking, uh, this is a cut through a long section looking to the west. Uh, the the, pro, the um, three ore bodies, musket, cannonball and camel would plunge to the north. Um, and, uh, and, and they're all within a three kilometre uh, long zone. Uh, you can see that the, the deposits remain open at depth um, and, and that's just been a lack of drilling, um, you know, because drilling starts to get expensive at 600 metres vertical depth um, with diamond. Uh, so, you know, plenty of room to grow, um, you know, a, a, and also grow along strike. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, what the economics could look like, the current nickel price is uh, around $8.50 a pound and the exchange rate is around 75, 76, 77. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a pre, um, there's an MPV on this project using it, if we were to build a concentrator there of around 80 million. Um, a lot of nickel companies are trading at about one times NPV. So versus ROCKS' uh, current market cap of, um, of 70 million, that would suggest that, um, that it's not being priced into our market cap at all at current levels. Next slide, please. So the project also, you know, we, we have 80 kilometres of strike of the belt um, and, and we're doing regional exploration to, to add tonnes to, to the project uh, uh, overall. Next slide, please. So in terms of Mount Fisher, um, we, um, we, we'll add, we'll, we're adding to the resource for exploration or aiming to add to the resource for exploration. Um, we think it's, you know, very undervalued in the rock structure. Um, you know, and we did say in our quarterly that we released today, you know, that we're considering what the best option um, to, to, to go forward on, on um, the fisheries nickel project is. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of news flow, we'll be drilling um, th at UME throughout the, um, throughout the next uh, 12 months with a focus on two major new targets, being link and junction. We'll be, um, we'll be estimating, um, re-estimating the overall resource and adding in the Grace Maiden resource 
and incorporating all the drilling that we've done uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, we'll be taking over management of uh, regional exploration joint ventures, and we may and, and we are looking to do something with our nickel portfolio, given the demand that we are that, that we are seeing for for that. Um, so later on in the year, we'll be um, we'll be working on feasibility studies and scoping studies at you and me, uh, and and we will be actively exploring regionally. Next slide, please. So just wrapping up um, and. Um, cognizant of time, uh, ROX, is, um, ROX is an active explorer. Uh, we're focused on our gold project. The gold sector is enjoying a, a strong uh, gold price, which most expect to continue. Uh, the nickel uh, price uh, it has recently, um, recently really recovered um, as the EV and battery thematic plays out. ROX has got good exposure to the nickel price via its nickel project at, at Fisher East. Um, you know, and so we see ourselves as having uh, multi-commodity exposure. Uh, I, I um, look forward to um, updating uh, you all further on our um, on our plans as um, as we get results. Thank you. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Alex. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Um, talking about results, there are some questions here. Um, you know, some of the it looks like your shareholders are looking for some of the the news flow that was expected, particularly in regards to uh, diamond drill results. So can you update yep. the market? Yeah, on sure. That? So so we we had a small diamond program. Uh, we had a small diamond program uh, that we conducted last year, testing Grace, and and, and we and we've um, put in a couple of holes to the to the on the northern end of Grace, not the southern end, the the best part of Grace, which is the southern end or the deepest part. Um, our drilling contract uh, was uh, was very slow and very costly, uh, so we cancelled the contract and we're um, we're retendering. So you know, there's been a hold up because of that. Okay, we've, we've got uh, quite a few other questions too, Alex. So what we might do is just um, get an article written during the week. Time is up, so um, I'm just aware of everyone's time. So thanks for that. And um, I'll follow up with you during the week. Great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Alex. See you again. Cheers. Thanks. Okay, thanks, everyone. That's all we have time for this week. We'll be back next week uh, with another edition of the Hidden Gems webinar. Thanks for your time.